So welcome to the Adaptex podcast, where we have discussions with individuals who are building accessible businesses or products, advocating for inclusion or excelling in adaptive sports. Our intention is never to speak on behalf of those with disabilities, but rather to amplify your ideas, voice it, and learn strategies to scale our impact and help other businesses become more inclusive and accessible. Today, I'm joined by Terrence Rubin, a physical therapist, athlete, and advocate for inclusion in endurance sports. He is one of the original co-founders of My Team Triumph, an organization founded in 2008 in his hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan. The organization has the mission of enhancing the health and well-being of individuals with disabilities by fostering lasting, authentic relationships through the teamwork environment of endurance athletics, obviously a topic that I'm passionate about as well through my involvement with Team Hoist. Terrence, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be on your podcast. Uh, before we talk about your work as a physical therapist and nonprofit organization, My Team Triumph, I'd like to talk a little bit about your upbringing. Uh, you grew up in apartheid South Africa, um, the African word for apartness, uh, where there was a series of laws that segregated the population by race. Um, I believe there are four classifications, white, Indian, colored, and black. And while it was most prevalent in the 1940s and the decades following, it stems back to the early 20th century. Uh, how did all of this affect your childhood or maybe the generation prior to you, your parents? Yeah, yeah, it, it wasn't a very interesting upbringing. And especially uh, the one correction would be that the, the category that I was in was an Asian category, not an Indian category. And so anyone from Asia was grouped into the same group as I was. Uh, in terms of uh, the official law going into effect, that was done in 1948. So it was very recent if you look at the historical timeline. But at the same time, the idea of segregation sort of got built into the culture, as you say, even before then. And so for my parents growing up, uh, they were so used to being segregated that they just lived within the, the confines of that whether it meant going to a different beach or taking a different bus or just living in a different neighborhood, that was the status quo. That's what they accepted. During my generation, especially as we got into the early 80s, is when the, the, the revolution really started as to uh, trying to figure out how do we just change this, this idea of oppression. And we also had more support across the bandwidth of all four racial groups that, that supported this idea of integration instead of segregation. Uh, and so my journey has been very interesting because you know, I, I started uh, being born in the, in the late 60s, in the early 70s, you kind of had to live with what the parents lived with and took that as the status quo. But then as you got a little wiser and you got a little older, you realized that this was wrong on so many levels and, and the human spirit should not be confined to a, a description of just uh, your skin color. Uh, and in, in the context of this conversation, sh it shouldn't be defined by the level of ability or disability, right? And so uh, as a means of leveling the playing field at a young age, uh, I took it upon myself to figure out how do we shift the needle? How do we move the bar? And not to just accept the, challenge, the, the status quo, but to challenge it. And, and I've kind of it became the foundational part of who I am today, you know, at the age of 56, still continuing to challenge the status quo and not accepting uh, things the way they are. Yeah, I was going to ask if the politics and just kind of your childhood influenced your approach to inclusion today. Um, I would imagine there's a lot of parallels between the two. Yeah, it has. And I think uh, on, on one end, there are people that lived through what I did and were very bitter from that experience and, and then almost created their own sort of reverse apartheid as they got um, you know, more educated and got into the, owning their own businesses and companies. I, on the other hand, uh, decided to take a different approach of just, you know, living the brightest light that I could live. I grew up in a family of faith with my dad being a pastor, my mom being a missionary. And our whole idea at home was always to like leave the community in a better place than we found it. So whatever that meant, you know, whether it was in work and how we lived and how we played sport, whatever we did, you know, the glory was beyond us. So from that faith background, it's really helped to define um, the thing that I, cu I currently do in my life. Was the schooling process different by those four different classifications? Like, were you aware through elementary school and middle school that you didn't have the same opportunities as others? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, even in segregation, as they tiered the, the, the racial divide by Caucasian or white being the top level, the next level were the Asians, which is the category in which I fell into. The third level down were the coloreds, and coloreds were not uh, referencing 
African folk, but was referencing people that were the offspring of a Caucasian and a local African, uh, you know, uh, marriage. Uh, so they actually made that a second, a, a whole uh, category of colored people. And then the people at the bottom of the tier, so to speak, were the local African people. And so everything got tiered around that, where, where, whether it was the best locations where you could live, to the kind of school system that you had, to the level of education that you had. And the sad part about having those four categories, the, the local African folk being at the bottom of that tier were always at a disadvantage because they had the lowest level of education. So when it came to going to college, everyone had to compete at the same level to get in. So as you can imagine, just based on that, the Caucasians were the highest number of folks that got into advanced education or college degrees. Uh, the Asians were second to that by, by a huge margin, and then the coloreds and, and the local African. Uh, and so even in, in my fight to, to get up there, we as, as young kids, especially in the Indian community, the Indian community in general is sort of very entrepreneurial, and they pushed their kids to get into, you know, education or economics or um, healthcare or uh, law or finance and those were the sort of we called the, the big five and so i ended up getting into healthcare and my sister got into education my brother got into finance but you know you were driven by some unknown force <laughs> throughout your childhood to do this as the level of accomplishment so to get into college we had to work really hard to get there and 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 uh, i'm used to the struggle and, and, and not using that as an excuse, but using that as a step up to the next level. Yeah, so you started university in 86? Yes, yeah, I graduated university. high school in 80, 85, started my first year in 86, did my first degree uh, majoring in microbiology and physiology, which then set a foundation for me to go into the physical therapy program three years later. Uh, which is not necessary in South Africa. You could go straight into the PT program there. The education system is very different than it is here in the US. Uh, but I'm thankful to have had that, that foundational background uh, because it then gave me a little bit more of a scientific research-based approach to everything that I do as a physical therapist. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but during those six years, so Mandela was released from prison in 1990, and then a lot of the apartheid laws were abolished in 91. Did that change your university experience or did the structure of the schools change at all during that time? No, not at all. The structure only officially changed in 94 during the okay. first election. So even though there was a withering away of some of these rules and laws, there was still, you know, the community hadn't changed. And in, you know, I started my physical therapy program in um, 89, I believe. Um, yeah. And, and, and that's when I met, I met my wife and my wife is Caucasian and Portuguese. Um, so I always say we started for a relationship with three strikes against me. I, I wasn't white, <laughs> I wasn't Portuguese. And, um, and, uh, you know, I, I just, I didn't fit into that culture that they had at the time. Yeah. Did so, she grow uh, up in South Africa as well? Yeah. She was born and raised in South Africa. Oh yeah. The third one was, I wasn't Catholic. Uh, so yeah, it was just interesting to, you know, to think of that as being a barrier to a relationship, right? Yeah. Uh, but in, in the bigger sense of things, it also helped mold me to who I am, to be tolerant of things that are of that nature and to raise my kids to understand and know better. Yeah, absolutely. What were your clinical rotations like during PT school? PT school is very interesting in South Africa, very different than the US, very different. And, you know, I always try to preface that with what we did 30 years ago, because I've been practicing now for 30 years. So, you know, 30, 34 years ago, uh, the programs, they were very, very intensely physical therapy. You never did any other subject but physical therapy for four years. And your last two years, you did a clinical rotation every day. So you did a half a day of clinical and then a half a day of actual education in the, in the lecture hall. And so your clinical rotation included working at a, like our acute care hospital where I went to school was a 2,700 bed hospital. Your rehab hospital was an 1800 bed hospital. So the clinical experience that we had when we was in the acute care system, I mean, everything from, you know, advanced ICU all the way down to post-surgical orthopedic neurological cases, things like that. And then people that made it through the acute care and were stable, but couldn't get home safely, were sent to the rehab hospital. So we had extensive exposure to all the neurological 
and orthopedic cases for you know weeks and months at a time. Um, so everything from burns cases all the way down to um, what they call like the brown C card, you know, where you get a stab wound and you have uh, uh, motor neuron issues on one side and sensory neuron issues on the other side. And just like sort of the most rare cases, we would see those cases as groups because there were that many of them. Mm, okay. All right. Um, what brought you to the States then to, to practice in the States? I, I love the idea of travel. And when I was 20 years old, I made my first, I, I had been working part time, saved some money and then went to Europe for six weeks. I have family in the Netherlands uh, and, and aunt and uncle that live there. Um, and so my, my aunt was one of the earlier people that I knew that was in a mixed marriage uh, relationship. And when she when my uncle and her started dating in South Africa, which was again against the law in the 60s, they had to actually flee the country at a certain point and they moved to the Netherlands, which is where my uncle was from. So I got to do my first vacation there and it really opened up my mind to everything that was, you know, not South Africa, not in the silos. Uh, and so then I wanted to travel the rest of the world. And, you know, of course, you go to Europe. The next thing is I want to go to the USA. And at that time in the in the early 90s, there was a huge shortage of physical therapists in in the, the US. I believe the numbers were like 50 to 80,000 therapists short nationally. So they started recruiting from a lot of English speaking countries uh, because in the interim of trying to do the recruitment, they were also trying to increase the number of people that were admitted to the PT program. So I was part of that group that was brought in from uh, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, England, a lot of English speaking countries. And some of the therapists that still are around today, you'll find that that's where their backgrounds from. Yeah. What was what was the biggest adjustment initially when you moved to the States? That's that's an interesting question, because, uh, you know, I grew up with, you know, the Brady Bunch in 80s enough on our TV stations. Right. And uh, and so you come here expecting this almost sort of perfect world and then you realize that it's not. Um, so it was almost a little bit of a, a reality check that all of America, all of the USA wasn't this perfect world and where people that very that lived very out of the world amazing lives but there were also people that struggled and and uh, and, and this population was a lot more diverse than i thought it would be the other, you know but the other interesting thing i also found that from a, a, a racial profiling standpoint um there was a little it was a it still existed here but just at a at a much more subtle level and it, that took me a little bit to get used to. I always felt like in South Africa, I knew what to expect. I knew how people felt. And so I, I responded accordingly. Whereas when I came to the US, people would say nice things, but then they would treat you, they'll still treat you differently. Yeah. So it took me a while to get used to that and not let it bother me. Do you feel like that's changed since you moved to the States or is it still pretty prominent? Oh, I think it is still pretty prominent, um, you know, uh, but again, uh, people can have certain cultural backgrounds and, and live with certain things that they, out of ignorance, rather than uh, a concerted decision to live this way. Uh, and I think uh, quite often when you meet with them and they get to meet with you, as with me as a person of color, uh, it's interesting how that, that changes, that pivots. Uh, so, for example, um, where I live here in Grand Rapids in West Michigan, there's a lot of a Dutch uh, settling. And so oftentimes, especially in the early days, people would walk into my practice and they would see me and you would, you could see the, you know, the look in their face, like, whoa, I'm in the wrong place. I don't know if I want to be here. And I will say something like, hello, can I help you? And I could hear from the accent that they still have a little bit of the, you know, a Dutch accent. So I would say, speak in the Netherlands. And they look at me like, wait a minute, did you just speak Dutch? What, like, why do you know that? But I grew up in South Africa where Afrikaans, which is a South African language, is 80% Dutch. And so using the tools and skills I have, I was able to communicate with someone that was different. And, and once you found that, that point of connection, it changed everything. And then I became like their favorite therapist and they didn't want to see anyone else. So my point again is when, when people get to you know you and you get to know them, you can always find a place of commonality, a place that you can agree on things. And the other part I found that is, um, you know, in South Africa, you could sit down with a group of friends and have completely opposing views on anything from politics to religion, but you could still be friends. Whereas here, people were like, if you don't, if you're not on the same page as me, 
you know, you're not part of the circle. And that took me a while to get used to that because, you know, I have strong views on things, but I also, I also respect the views of others. Um, and I try to, you know, just to spread that respect amongst my friends to say, okay, it's okay to have a different view, but let's respect each other and walk away knowing that we just educate ourselves a little bit more. Yeah, the previous points you were making have a lot of parallels to working with people with disabilities, I feel like building rapport, genuine interest in their motivations and their interests. And that's kind of how you develop those relationships and you understand how they communicate and how they experience the world. Um, so I think there's a lot of parallels between acclimating to different cultures and then acclimating to different abilities as well. Um, you were the director of outpatient services uh, in the sports rehab department, correct, at Mary Freebed? Yes, yes. Um, were you recruited by them directly or did you find that position when you got here? Well, it was um, when I first came to the U.S., I actually came to Michigan because the company that recruited me was from Grand Haven, Michigan. And uh, so they gave me an option to work wherever I wanted in the state because there were so many openings I could pick and choose. And based on me being happy and settled, there were a few more colleagues from South Africa that would just follow me based on my words. So I felt like I was the Joshua of the group. Go and see if the land is fruitful and plentiful, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I get my first job in a small town called Alma, Michigan. And then my, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, came and joined me in that place. And we grew the practice to quite, quite a large presence. We, we were here just for one year. Uh, because that was the nature of our H-1B visa at the time. But after uh, about a few months in, they recognized the talents and skills that we could bring to the table. So they offered to, to process our green cards for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if we would stay on for one more year. So it's like, oh yeah, great. We want to see this country. Let's do that. Uh, but we ended up staying for three and a half years with that company. And then my wife and I traveled for two years and we've lived in Indiana and in New York and in North Carolina doing contract work. And one of the contracts brought us to back to Grand Rapids. We wanted to reconnect with some friends. So like, let's go back to Michigan, take this job. And the job we had was uh, at the uh, local uh, hospital called Metro Health or Metropolitan Hospital back in the day. But the, all the clinicians were contracted from the, uh, another rehab hospital called Mary Freebed. And so working here for a couple of weeks, they wanted to offer us full-time positions, uh, which we negotiated and accepted after a few months. And that's how we ended up settling here in West Michigan. Uh, they were, for me specifically, they were looking for someone to, to build and grow a sports program. And I, I have a lot of entrepreneurial kind of uh, things going on in my head and, and they could recognize that right away. And for my wife, her specialty was in neuro. So stroke and Parkinson's. And so she helped build that program. So we both came on as, as big assets to the company. Um, and uh, over the years, as I've de developed different programs, I got to the point where they then moved me into a director of outpatient services or uh, director of sports rehab kind of uh, positions. I found it interesting reading about the history of Mary Freebed as a whole, uh, just kind of how it started in the late 19th century and how it kind of came to be. Are there multiple locations around the states or? Um, no, not around the states, but in, in Michigan, Mary Freebed has created specific like partnerships with different hospital groups. They have quite a good presence and, and their sweet spot really is the, the inpatient rehabilitation. So massive, you know, um, neurological like strokes and things like that where you would need re more rehab than just in an outpatient setting. Uh, and then motor vehicle accidents, they really are the top in, in the country, if not in the world for doing that kind of work. They also do a lot of work in pediatrics. Um, so a lot of the uh, earlier, younger diagnoses, diagnoses that often get either missed or not well treated, Freebed has a, an amazing way of managing that patient load. So people come in from at least different parts of the country to come and have their rehab here for that. They've also developed a very good orthotics and prosthetics program. So they were like the leaders in creating some of the devices that you see all over right now. And Freebed uh, staff are the ones that brought that into, into this rehab picture. Um, their outpatient programs have been okay. Uh, and that's what I was trying to help build, develop, and grow. Um, and uh, so that's 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 the world that I was involved in the most, though, outpatient, not not inpatient or pediatric. So you were there for 23, 24 years? 
20, yeah, 25 years would have been 25 years is April, but I, I resigned earlier in the year and my last day was Feb 14 of, of 2023. And now you're the owner of PT Sports Pro. Um, right, right. What, what kind of influenced the, the change or the shift from uh, hospital based versus is this a private practice clinic now? Yeah, correct. So, you know, uh, my my approach to to care um, and to athletes and to all my patients really was always to to give them the highest level of care that that they needed, and uh, which meant that a lot of one on one time with my patient um, and then a lot of daily pivots from treatment to treatment. So I, I just don't do the same thing every time they come in. Uh, my approach has always been hands on. Uh, with my patients. So if they're there for 45 minutes to an hour, the first 30 minutes of it is like hands on and making sure I can figure out what's going on with their muscle, their soft tissue, their joints. And then once I get that released, then I will move on to some of the exercise and activity that, that I would have them do in the gym. Uh, and, and, you know, especially post COVID, it was starting to shift. There was a lot of pressure to do more like group kind of therapies and sessions, which I didn't philosophically agree with. Um, but instead of being the uh, the person that sort of bucked the system, I recognized at that point that maybe it made more sense for me to separate out and do my own thing. Uh, so that led to, um, you know, the, I think the, uh, the trigger as well was a couple of really key staff were let go post COVID that I couldn't, I couldn't see how, how that should happen in a system the way it did. Uh, so you know, I, I that was I started making my move to figure out a, a different business plan or a different business option. So I set up PT Sports Pro and um, resigned, like I said, on Feb 14. I had a whole day of retirement before kicking it in on uh, Feb 16 uh, with PT Sports Pro as my official PLLC. Um, I'm opening up a big private, uh, what I call a sports and wellness practice. Um, my my vision is to build it for the elite athletes. So an absolutely high level concierge care type sort of practice that has all the fittings and visuals of a high level practice, but open it to the masses. So I want anyone that has an, uh, you know, any kind of injury to come and see us and get the kind of care that, that I think we are capable of providing as clinicians and not consider the, the, the bottom line or the dollar as the as the lead in, in a treatment, but consider the patient in front of you as what do they need and how can we deliver that best quality all the time consistent. My goal my is that is that the practices around me start seeing that success can be had with one on one good quality care. And then they start to copy me because if they do, not only does our profession get elevated, but our community benefits. So uh, I always say I could have retired after 30 years, but I decided to do this as, as my gift to our community. Uh, and especially with my involvement with my team Triumph, I wanted to create a space where, you know, you don't just come in and have rehab, but if you needed a space to kind of work out and under supervision of a personal trainer or an exercise physiologist, we should be able to provide all levels of care. So we can take care of the elite athlete that wants to have a DEXA scan and a lactate threshold test and any kind of performance testing to the uh, the total the person with a total knee replacement that just wants to come in and have therapy. And my, my tagline is, you know, treating you like a pro. We treat everyone like pros when they walk through the door. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, we added a physical therapy clinic adjacent to our gym about nine months ago. And when I was seeking out what um, what business to affiliate with, that was one of the big things that I wanted a PT that was hands on and that worked one on one with clients and didn't just do the same rudimentary treatment for every person. Um, right. Are you are you a cash based practice? So we'll be doing uh, well because we're we're still building out the practice <laughs> so it'll be open on hopefully december january but yes the the short answer is yes we'll be cash based and insurance uh, and we'll be providing all levels of service if someone comes into my practice and say man i wish you had this service or this test i will be figuring out how to make sure we add it to a slate of of things that we do yeah the the benefit or at least one of the benefits of cash based is that it doesn't have to be influenced by a script, right? Like, right. As opposed to a generic, you get eight, eight PT sessions and then you're done. 
with a cash-based practice, you have a little more flexibility in how you treat a patient, right? Yeah, and, and the state of Michigan does have a um, uh, direct access policy, which means that you do not need a referral for several of the insurance companies where they can have 10 visits up to 30 days uh, within 30 day period uh, without needing a referral. Uh, but, you know, I can see the pros and cons of that as well. And uh, I know for me, my, my goal is to provide what the patients need uh, versus just going, oh, we can do 10 visits. So let's fill our practice with people that have 10 visits and done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, my, my history has always been very good with my patients in terms of uh, number of visits used and then the the uh, the expected results. Are you hoping to have clients with disabilities? Uh, oh, absolutely. Well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I've uh, the testing lab, the performance testing lab that I'm building. I want to be able to to put people with different levels of disability through the tests that we normally do. So, how do we do a? Uh, why is a DEXA scan, for example, important? For someone who is a paraplegic versus someone who has cerebral palsy, um, why do we need to do a VO2 max or lactate threshold test on these individuals? Uh, what are the uh, the standards right now, which there aren't any for someone with a disability? Well, then how can we be part of the the the, the solution of creating those standards? Because we have more and more, especially with the wheelchair adaptive athletes, for example, that are racing at a very high level, right? And they don't know how they can tweak their performance. If they don't have any baseline data and and integrated with performance comes personal training but also management of an injury so that's why with physical with with pt sports pro the pt stands for physical therapy but also for personal training and performance testing and we integrate that all into one and and, and the way i look at it is that the physical therapy but is a small part of this bigger sports and wellness view that we're going to have so that we can all you know, you know perform at our at our best yeah, we'll have to uh, we'll have to loop you into our research then, because the person who introduced us, Brian, uh, him and I are working on a project now uh -huh. um, that revolves around high intensity strength training for people with Down syndrome, and we were looking uh -huh. at some of the different constructs that we want to measure, and whether it's body composition, and we have VO two max testing, we have a metabolic cart here at my gym, um, uh -huh. so maybe maybe we can work together to kind of oh, elevate, uh, elevate the standards for uh, performance training for people with disabilities. That's uh, kind of why I started my gym seven years ago. And yeah. uh, it's always great to affiliate with people uh, that are doing similar things. Yeah. Uh, before we talk about my team triumph, um, just when I was prepping for this, and um, this was one of the more excited I've been for the podcast discussions. And there were just like a lot of similarities between uh, the work that we do and also kind of like our familial background and stuff. Um, you mentioned meeting your wife uh, during university. And then uh, more recently, I read a few articles and watched a couple videos um, on her diagnosis with adrenal cortical carcinoma. Um, when I was 17, one of my best friends was diagnosed with the same uh, form of cancer, uh, which is very rare. Uh, I think they say one in a million or so. So maybe the, the chances of two people um, with a, a close relative or a close friends with the diagnosis is even more uh, unlikely. But uh, Leah went to University of Michigan, met with Dr. Uh, Hammer, who uh, was in some of the videos that I watched with your wife as well. Um, what was that like? And uh, so she was diagnosed in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but 2021 or 2020? 2020. 2020 during the start of COVID and yeah, um, yeah. maybe can you kind of walk me through what that process was like and maybe if that's had any influence on uh, your last few years of work and kind of what you want to accomplish and yeah yeah absolutely um, you know my my wife works in inpatient rehab at the local hospital um, so she's often in close contact with patients COVID hits and you know they had to start wearing masks and shields and all sorts of gear. But, but a lot of the patients that would come in, they were patients that had the symptoms and we knew right away they were in a COVID ward and COVID floor and extra precautions were taken, but your general precautions weren't as closely followed, you know, with the regular uh, population because there was a lot of uh, unknowns at the time. And so you could work with a patient that, that actually was COVID positive, but just didn't test positive yet. Uh, and so uh, in one of her episodes, I remember her talking about a patient that was having some, you know, coughing and what have you, but hadn't been diagnosed uh, or, 
or confirmed as a COVID positive test. And she went to lift out the patient. The patient went into a coughing uh, spurt and, and Tina felt like, well, you know, if anything, I could put my finger on that one case. Uh, but at, at that time, wearing the masks uh, was also quite an uh, oppressive kind of thing. And so she'd come home and she'd be like, man, you know, my forehead hurts and, and, and this hurts and that hurts, but it's probably the mask and wearing it all the time. But she started to notice that um, like, uh, she's like, my, my pulse feels really strong and it feels like my heart's racing. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, that's probably the anxiety from wearing the mask. And we try to calm her fears and that. But um, when it didn't settle down, we had to go and go into the local doctor, which was in early May. And I remember they checked her blood pressure. It was 200 over 100, which is unheard of, you know, for especially for her. She runs a regular, always has been like 120 over 80. And so they gave her some blood pressure, pressure lowering medication and they ran a few blood tests and then the results came back the next day that her potassium level was really low. So they put her on potassium pills and uh, and they said this would also help restore some of the, the balance and, and her symptoms should, should decrease. By that Monday, Tuesday, it still didn't decrease. So they sent her to the hospital and said, you know, just go to the ER, get an IV of potassium. Let's see if that gets your levels up. So they tested her levels before the, the potassium infusion, ran the, the infusion, and after they, when they retested, instead of the numbers going up, it actually dropped even further when she was at that critical level. So they decided to admit her that Wednesday night um, just to kind of figure out what the heck's going on. The next morning, um, they, they during the rounds, the doctor said, hey, you're one of us, you work in this hospital, because she, she actually ended up being admitted to where she actually worked. Let's, let's run, through these tests, make sure you're taken care of well. But you know, have you ever had any COVID symptoms? And she's like, no. She's like, well, we're going to test you anyways. Well, they test her and she tests positive. So they isolated her right away. And of course, during this whole time, I couldn't be with her because of all the COVID precautions. So we're like FaceTiming and, you know, she didn't, she even drove herself to the ER. She goes, there's no point in me driving her there. I wouldn't be allowed inside. And she just like at the last minute packed uh, an extra, you know, shirt and some underwear and said, just in case, I'll just take this with me. And I'm glad she did because she ended up staying in the hospital for a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, during that time is when they also found out that her um, uh, levels of, um, I think it was, I can't even remember now, the adrenal cortical levels was, was super, you know, off the charts, off, wrong and super high. And so when they um, when they saw that, I think it was supposed to be like around 5,000 units and she was like at 60,000 units or something. That's when they said, okay, you know, we got to do a CT scan. And the CT scan showed a huge tumor, sort of the size of a first over left adrenal gland. Uh, and we get this news on a Monday evening, I think it was like around the 18th or something of May, uh, where the doctor had gone home. And then when he saw the results, he came back in to give her the news in person because he was he was even shocked he had not even seen a case like this in his tenure uh, and so we got on and i'm on the phone trying to listen to all of this and that's kind of was the start of our journey with this the c word right cancer um and he said it's, it's very grave you know there's a lot of risk even in doing a surgery and we went through all of that and and again you know we, we prayed a lot about where we were in our journey um and then you know fast forward to within uh, 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 by the end of that week, this was on a Monday. So they, they kept her in the hospital, tried to figure out what they could do in terms of surgery. We looked at a local surgeon, but, but ended up getting connected to U of M and Dr. Hammer then became in charge of her case. Uh, met with a really good surgeon, Dr. Barb Miller, who uh, you know a week later got on a virtual call with us and, and gave us the lowdown of what needed to happen. The tumor was touching her diaphragm her stomach, her uh, pancreas, her spleen, her uh, aorta, and then sat on top of her left kidney. So, so Dr. Miller said, okay, we'll, we'll take out the tumor, we'll resect all those areas, we'll remove the kidney, resect and, you know, connect whatever needed to be done. And we're like, oh, it's a, it's a pretty extensive surgery, but Dr. Miller was confident she could handle it all. Um, it was, we had this, this is the, the Thursday after the um, uh, Memorial Day, is when we're having this virtual meeting and surgery was about three or four weeks out. And we we're like, but you know, how, you know, what's gonna happen to this tumor? Is it gonna grow? What's gonna happen? And in that time, as we kind of, you know, dealt with this decision, Dr. Miller looks at her schedule and she goes, oh, wait a minute, I could see you on Monday, like three days later. 
And so right there, that was like the first step in all of these series of miracles. Um, she goes in and uh, I had to take her to U of M, drop her off and then come back home because I couldn't even go in with her. Uh, and if something did happen to her on the table, I couldn't go in and it was it was just so weird how we had to pivot what our normal minds would think about how we spend time with each other and what we do, which segues to the question that you ask. And so that night I get home and by the time I got home, I actually got lost coming back home. Even though I have GPS, I never get lost. But my brain was that distracted with what was going on. So by the time I did get home, I literally sat on the couch and I get a call from Dr. Miller saying, hey, Terrence, this is Barb. I wanted you to know that we went in. So they had to basically cut her across the entire abdomen, you know, remove the organs, the, the gut, basically, so they can get to the adrenal gland. And she said, I got in there, did all the things that we needed to do, and was able to just lift this tumor out of there without touching, need, with, it wasn't attached to any of the other structures, even though it was touching all of them. So they got it just in time. And they, they were even able to save the kidney. And so with that, you know, we realized that that there is a purpose to who we are and how we exist. Um, and uh, when Tina was diagnosed uh, and, and we were just like distraught with fear and anxiety because we have no family. It's just the two of us and our kids. All her family live in Portugal. My family's in South Africa. No one could travel at the time. No one could be with us in, in terms of the support system. But our friends were our family here and they supported us well. And, and that night when we got the diagnosis and uh, she finally, you know, after emotionally just trying to deal with it, she's like, I'm going to hang up the phone right now and let me just settle into all of this and I'll call you right back. And in that time, uh, a nurse even went into Tina's room and said, hey, Tina, I know that your family can't be here and I shouldn't even be here because she's in a full hazmat suit at this point. The nurse goes, but if you want, I can stay here and hold your hand as long as you want. So she did that and consoled Tina. And when the nurse left, Tina had this, this scripture that just came to her mind, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I, the Lord, know the plans I have for you. And, um, and so Tina writes it on a whiteboard in her room and then calls me and says, hey, I don't know why the scripture came into my head, but here it is. And when I read this, I just feel at such intense, calm peace. And, uh, and, and with that, you know, we talked about it a little bit and, and then she went to bed and she actually slept well that night. The next morning, that same nurse comes in, into the room and sees the scripture on the wall and goes, hey, you know, I, uh, I didn't, are you a Christian? And Tina goes, yeah, 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 I am. And she goes, you know what? She takes a dry erase to the board and wherever it says, well, I know the plans I have for you, she took out the word you and she wrote in Tina's name. And that's when the story became super personal in terms of how we connect our faith to our, our lives, right? And so when this tumor, when the, when the doctor said I went in, and I was able to remove that tumor, like I, and she used the word like it was like some like a miracle. I was able to remove this tumor without having to reset anything else. There was like there was no other way to explain this, and that's how you know your life is beyond just who you are and how you exist. When we got the diagnosis, we decided as a family that we would spend our time living, not dying, because as you know, the the. Uh, the mortality rate for this cancer is very high as well. The survival rate after five years is 10 to 25%. And I said to Tina, you know what? We don't know which direction this is going to go, but someone has to be in that 10 to 25%. Why not us? And at the end of the day, does it matter whether we live or die as long as we live our, our lives to the best you know, version of, of ourselves and bear testimony to everything God has done for us. And that's how we've lived. And she she's not on social media, but she asked me to share her story. And by doing so, we've been, been able to help so many people that have found this this toxic culture, on, on especially on social media, and wanted to get away from it all. And then saw a story like this and then got inspired to like, you know what? Why don't we live each day that like, like it was our last day? Why don't we celebrate each other in our relationships like we should every day? Instead, when something goes wrong, then we're like, oh my gosh, but I, I really love you. I really value you. And then you, you tend to connect a little bit more in those times of desperation. But why can't that be every day? And so, as Tina says, cancer was not a gift, but it has given us gifts. Gifts to love more, to trust more to serve more, to just be the best versions of ourselves that we can be, not just, you know, during the, the Christmas seasons or during Thanksgiving, but every day. So that's yeah. that's what we try to do every day. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that, even if it's not like 
directly related to inclusion or accessibility. I think it's, I can think of a few conversations that I've had with some uh, individuals who've had spinal cord injuries, and it's interesting to listen to some of them move towards faith and then others move away from faith. And um, it's even in like the medical humanities, some of the stuff that I've read about that domain, it's like the intersection of literature and philosophy and religion in how people recover from uh, medical conditions and the importance of it in, in people's uh, rehab process. So it's a very interesting topic. And um, yeah. I, I appreciate you sharing the story as a whole because it was it was just a connection that I felt strongly about. Um, yeah. Leah's uh, yeah. treatment uh, influenced my life a lot. So um, yeah, and, hopefully, and it hopefully. actually has impacted how we see someone with a disability, right? Because then we realize that that every opportunity to be in front of someone that is different in whatever way is is an opportunity that doesn't just happen. So you make the best of it. Uh, so, for example, when I talk to any of our, so in, in my team triumph, we call the person with a disability the captain. When I talk to any captain, whether they're verbal or not, I always look them in the eye and I speak to the captain. If, if, the, if the parents have to translate and what have you, that's great. But I, my focus is on the person in front of me versus talking to the parent and they speak on behalf of the captain. So I think as we approach, you know, people with different disabilities, the goal is to sometimes even just the, the uh, just sharing, hey, how are you doing today? Are you ready to race? Changes everything because we are talking to them. We're not talking about them. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's an etiquette and a communication thing that we talk to our coaches about. Like, um, there are some tendencies for people to either talk to someone with a disability like they're elementary, like kind of baby talk, or talk to them as if they're lesser, or like you said, when they're working with a caregiver to talk directly to the caregiver and ignore the athlete. So those are, those are kind of like etiquette and communication things that I think are essential to just demonstrating respect for people of all abilities. Uh, but that's a good, that's a good segue into my team triumph. So um, you started it in 2008. Was there a specific individual or experience that kind of influenced you to get involved? No, actually, it, it wasn't an individual, but it was an experience because in 2007, I was turning 40 and decided to do my first Ironman race. And so I, I signed up for the Wisconsin Ironman, which, as you know, or may know, you've got to sign up a whole year in advance. And so I went through this whole journey of of training and sadly being away from home a lot more than my wife wanted me to be away from home training. Uh, but I got to this event uh, in September of uh, 2007 um, and I was ready to take this on and, and prove to the world, prove to myself that at 40 I could still you know do this as an athlete. Uh, but then I started, I met people that were there for other reasons. They were trying to raise funds or awareness for different organizations or different uh, things in the communities. And I, I felt a little guilty initially, but I thought, no, I'm here. This is my mission right now to do this event. But I, when I when I got done and I was able to accomplish, you know, um, finishing this Ironman, I did come back home and started talking to a friend about it. And, and he was uh, in charge or he owned our local triathlon club of, of which I was a member. And I said to Wayne, I'm like, Wayne, you know, so I've been thinking, yeah, and then I go down this road about like, how do we use our skills and talents as triathletes or as athletes to help someone, you know, and, and at, that at that point, we weren't looking necessarily at someone with a disability, but just in general, like, you know, can we go to a nursing home and take people for rides or what, how do we do as How do we do this as our team? And we probably had about 50 to 75 members on our team, maybe more. Um, but um, so Wayne goes, you know what, I've had this other gentleman talk to me about, you know, doing something like this. We should just get together and put our ideas on paper and figure out how we make it happen. So that was the first introduction to, to this, this idea. And at that time, we didn't even have a name for it. And, and in our meeting, we kind of, you know, the things that came up was they, you know, you've, you've um, uh, you said you've done some stuff with Team Hoyt. Um, and I, I had the privilege, the pleasure of meeting Dick Hoyt uh, a few years ago when I was in Boston. Um, but, um, you know, I, at that time, I did not know about the Hoyts. I mean, remember, I'm, I'm like the foreign transplant here, so I didn't see that. But I, I knew that there were a few one-on-one -on -one family members, individuals that were racing. But the question that we had was, how does it work if you 
the person with a disability has no one around you that can race with you, no one in your family that's an athlete, how do you get the opportunity to race? So we came up with this idea of my team triumph, where if I could find, if we were going to be doing a 5K, if I could find three people that could finish a 5K in a reasonable time, I could put them together, match them with someone with a disability, and they could push that person through that 5K. And if one got tired, the other one will take over. The idea was as a team, they would complete the event. And the reason why we needed the team is because these athletes, these individuals don't get a chance to otherwise train with the person in the chair or the person with a disability. So they just literally are going to meet on race morning. So having the ability to finish a 5K within a reasonable time and then push a chair through takes, you know, some meshing of skills. And so it became this team effort. And we really wanted to make the race all about the person in the chair, the person with the disability. So we call them the captain. The athletes, we wanted them in the background, kind of taking care of business. So we call them the angels because they did the work. The recognition wasn't about the athletes, though. So most of the time, 98% of the time, the, the captain wears the race verb, the timing chip. Their names actually show up in the results. The angels, nothing, just a red shirt that says My Team Triumph Angel in it, just so that people on the course recognize who they are and they're not just banditing a race. And so that, that, has what that's what defined my team triumph and we did our first race was a triathlon called tri del sol and we did that in 2008 so uh, the spring of 08 which is in march is when we got all the paperwork put together the legal work done set up as a 5013 c and then july of that year is when we did our first race and that first year we just did like i think three or four races uh with just uh, i think the first race was just two captains and I was one of the original angels as well. And my job on the on the board when we started was to take care of equipment and make sure that we got the right equipment to race in. And each of us had these different roles. And by the end of that year, after four races, you know, trying to convince race directors that it was okay for us to be in a race because we have rules of engagements and protocols that'll keep not just our group safe, but all the participants around us safe as well. That was helpful to then help us move forward. At which point we got a, a reach out by others that had heard of our story and wanted to know how could they do this in their state and so in 09 we formed a chapter structure and west michigan uh, became so if the, the the original racing group in west michigan in grand rapids became the first chapter and we created a national a national body that then helped to take the operations of that chapter and duplicate it across the country so fast forward to 2023 we now have 14 chapters across the country that do this. Our goal is to create depth in relationships and having authentic relationships versus breadth and just trying to do a ton of events that that doesn't have the meaning that it needs to have for our captains. Every experience with them, as we talked about our journey with cancer, every experience with these captains could be has to be the best experience. So we go all out and try to provide that for them. And, and sadly, for some of our captains that have been more fragile, their first experience ended up being one of the last experiences that they had with us because within uh, before they could come and race with us again, they passed away in between in that interim. And so we were glad that we were able to provide them with this amazing experience. And we've had those parents that have reached out to us afterwards saying, thank you so much for doing that. They talked about the experience that entire time. They wore their medal for a whole week after the race. So, so we want to make sure that it's not just a handout. You know, it's an earned medal. It's an accomplishment. Um, even just to sit in the chair for the time that they have to, takes it takes a while. It takes a lot, and it is you know it, it has a, a toll on the body as well. And then we've had other captains that have done you know. 30, 60, 100 races with us and have accumulated medals and have accumulated you know, race numbers. And, and for them, this has now become their point of bragging. Up to this point, I remember one of our first captains sat in his living room just looking out the window at the kids playing shooting hoops and felt that he couldn't be part of that. And after he did his first race with us, he was able to get out there in his power chair with his medal on and talk about what he just got to do on the weekend. So it is life changing. And, and something that starts as a small effort to just move the needle just a little bit has become this larger movement where now, especially in West Michigan, getting into a race with someone with a disability is like, yes, how do we make that happen? Whereas when we first started, it's like, nope, you're not allowed to do this race, you, you know? And so, so we, we, got, we, we figured out how to diplomatically work through the process 
of getting the yeses from our race directors to the point now that they invite us they want us to be there and we're happy to make that happen yeah yeah it's motivating i guess when you hear those captains reflect on their race experience and kind of how it transpires into other aspects of their life as well you mentioned when you first started triathlon it's like a very individual it's a very um in like individual centric sport and what i love personally about racing uh with jacob is that it it kind of gives it meaning beyond myself um when i'm training by myself i'm envisioning the races when jacob's kind of like he dances in our chair like we have music that plays like he like he seems to like feed off the crowd and stuff and so i'm envisioning those moments uh, when workouts are getting hard, when running's getting hard. And it's, it's, um, it's gotten me through a lot over the last nine years, uh, that Jacob and I have been running together. We've done about a hundred races together. Um, Mm. and we'll be running Boston this April for the first time together. Um, but what is, what are like the steps and challenges of kind of building a membership organization? Um, like, are you concerned about the people that represent those chapters? Is there like a vetting process, an interview process? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question because so over the years, I focused initially on West Michigan, operationally trying to get this organization nice and tight so it can be well duplicated. But in those years, the growth was almost too rapid to where the new chapters that started in some of these places didn't understand what they were getting themselves into. And so some of those chapters, so we had more than 14 chapters and some of those actually closed or folded just because, you know, they started off with the right reasons, but they didn't have a good sustainability plan. So about post COVID or during COVID, we had to let go of our executive team because we just couldn't have that level of infrastructure and be able to and afford to pay them. And when we let that go, um, they appointed me as president of the national board. And I took that opportunity to sort of reset some of the things to get us back to where, to the original values of what we started with, deep, authentic relationships. So I didn't care how many chapters we had, but if we if we had a chapter, how do we make it the best chapter for that area, for that group, for the people that were on the, on the ground doing the work? Uh, and so that's really has been the, the hardest or the biggest challenge, right? Is because, uh, so when I got into it, I did not have a family member or anyone that I knew with a physical disability. So for me, it was just this passion to move the needle, change the, the, this uh, challenge, the status quo, but for, uh, other people that started off, they were family members of an individual with a disability. And so as they started to grow the organization, it also started to take away from what they were trying to do with their own kids or their own family members. And that became a stress point. So having a right uh, blend of board members, for example, to decompress that makes a big difference. And also in, in our situation here in West Michigan, I can easily disassociate myself from individuals and look at the larger group. Whereas when you have a child, it's hard to do that, right? Because you want to take care of them, but you also want to create more opportunities. So what we've decided or or started doing is just making sure that everyone, that you shouldn't feel guilty about adding more people. Just, Just continue to do the right thing. And I don't feel challenged by or concerned by other organizations doing the same thing. Because I remember when we started, there weren't, too many p- people that were doing it in to the extent that my team Triumph did. Yeah. These other organizations grew and started doing it since then, but not prior to then. Prior to then, it was a lot of the one-on-one. So for me, it didn't matter. As a, as a matter of fact, I did the rock and roll half marathon in Feb this year, and I, I could represent my team Triumph with my shirt, mm-hmm. but I worked with a, a Team White uh, chapter yeah. from yeah. Vegas. And I pushed someone in a Ainsley's Angels chair. <laughs> and for me, that's the best of all three worlds colliding. And, and, and what it became about that day was about Captain Chris. It wasn't about an organization, but it was about a person. And so that, for me, is what my goal is. is The challenge, really, is to take out the blinkers and see yourself as an organization, and then, but, but see the individual that you're trying to create the experience for and do it for that reason. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And obviously, it's, it's never going to be an individual mission, and you can only accomplish so much uh, working on your own. Uh, So it would be 
better if a lot of organizations that uh, had similar missions were more collaborative in nature. I've, I've unfortunately found that not to always be the case, uh, yeah. but it would it would be excellent if it was uh, keeping the keeping the goal the goal, but realizing that you can learn so much and you can reach more people um, the more you work with those other organizations. Uh, maybe do you have a, a favorite race that stands out or a favorite running experience? <laughs> so yeah so uh, in terms of a uh, favorite running experience uh so captain matt smith was our first captain in 2008 he was 11 years old i believe when he did his first race with us um, and matt and i have done quite a few like races at you know different places together when he turned 18 i wanted to create a special thing for him so we created the four state marathon challenge where just him and I hit the road and ran, we ran a marathon in Ohio, in Indiana, in Wisconsin, and then in Grand Rapids. And uh, that was, that was an amazing, amazing experience for me. Matt's parents had never let him go out with anyone up to that point, because there was no, no one had established, no outsider from outside the family had established that kind of relationship and rapport. And, and so for me, it was uh, a reflection of the trust that we had built over the years. And Matt and I had an absolute blast. Now, was it work? Yeah. Did I have a whole new respect for Matt's parents? Absolutely. Because, you know, I would get him in the car, I'd put his wheelchair away, strap him in. We get to a restaurant and need to use the bathroom. You got to take him out, put him in the chair, get him into the restaurant. And, and so on race morning, I was up at three in the morning get myself ready then i had to get matt ready and load everyone into the into the vehicle because it was just him and i and then we'd get to the race site and then i had to open the chair assemble it check the tire pressures get him in the chair and then get to the starting line and who believe it or not that's when i could like i can relax i'm about to run a marathon and then you had to run a marathon and I, felt like I, I ran a marathon already for three hours and the actual marathon itself was going to be the easiest part of my day. <laughs> uh, and so I really got a whole newfound ex you know, appreciation for parents or family members of those with disabilities, but also got an understanding of how someone with a disability can feel like a burden, right? Uh, unless we take that, we, we decompress that burden and let them know that it's okay. We all function differently. We just got to figure out how to help each other out. Yeah. And that's it. You know, it's just an unconditional act of things that we just do. Why? Because we're human. This is our society. This is what we do. Yeah. So for me, that was a whole, whole appreciation there of being able to do those marathons with Matt. As a matter of fact, um, we had our national conference um, around that same in the next couple of years in Vegas. And um, Matt and I flew out to Vegas and I, and I took him on a, on a trip going, all right, we're going to do this. Uh, and he's, he'd never been on a plane before. And I'd never traveled on a plane with someone with a disability. And yet we figured it out and we had a, an amazing time. So for me, that, that experience was amazing. And the other event that stands out is um, Johnny Agar. I don't know if you're familiar with Team Agar. Yep. But Johnny started racing with us in through my team Triumph first until his dad then asked if he could do a 5K with his kid. And that pretty soon grew into them doing more and more races when Jeff, the dad, saw how much Johnny enjoyed racing. But Jeff and the whole Agar family have always been very thankful to my team Triumph for all the things that we were able to you know, get them to, to the point when they got invited to Kona in 2016, yeah, they asked me to travel with them and help them you know, with logistics. Because again, outside of, of being an athlete, I also could understand the setup, the bike, the transitions and what have you. And so I got to help them with all of those things. Uh, and whenever Johnny raced, and even though he didn't finish that one, he was able to do several other races in Florida and in Texas. And wherever he went, I went with the family. I traveled, I got to travel to Germany when they did the Roth Challenge out there. So for me, uh, in terms of kind of, you know, being able to, to create this impact that is bigger and way beyond what I could even imagine, that was an amazing ad adventure as well. So we've got some great, great things. And, and then to meet Dick when we went to um, to the Boston Marathon in 2017, 18, I believe. Um, and we, we just ran into him totally by accident at the hotel lobby. And I walked up and I'm sorry, he was just having lunch with Kathy. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're Dick Hoyt. I'm Terrence Rubin. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you. 
um, here's who I am and what I, you know, where I come from. And Matt Smith was, I had taken Matt with me to Boston and this is Matt Smith and I introduced him and Dick looked at Matt and started talking, you know, with him. And he said, Matt, you remind me so much of my son, Rick, except you can speak. And for those five days that we were there, Dick found us whenever he could and would have these, he would stop everything and have a long conversation with Matt the whole time, sure. even came to our booth during the expo and hung out with us a little bit. And so for me, that's really what it's all about again, right? Because sometimes you can get lost in a name or a title that you forget the impact that you can have on an individual. And, and it is, it's important for us to continue to have impacts on individuals as well. Yes, there's this bigger, greater picture, but you know everything should be personalized to the person that's in front of you. Yeah, yeah, I probably can't articulate it any better than that. Um, but it was the same. Like uh, Dick has obviously played a, a huge role in my life. And um, last time I saw him was at my wedding, and um, we qualified for Boston two days before Rick recently passed away. So it's all been like um, they've played a huge role in everything I do. And now we run the the Rick White Research Lab here at my facility. I asked um, Rick. Uh, earlier this year if I could name it after him because uh, we want to do work on cerebral palsy. Um, so that's a good reminder every day I come into work to uh, to see his name up there and um, carrying on some of the stuff that they do is, is important to yeah, myself and, and I'm sure you as well. But we wrap up a lot of these discussions with um, this question. So is there anything specific that you think, um, like, we're in the fitness industry, but maybe we can also say endurance sports as well. Uh, like what the fitness industry needs to do to become more inclusive or accessible. Yeah, no, uh, and this is down to what you're creating right now with Adapt X, right? It's, I think, uh, in, in the fitness industry, if you look at the design of all the equipment we have, um, they're starting to shift a little bit more to 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 equipment that is more adaptive for someone in a wheelchair with a dis with a, a disability, uh, and I think in in when I, when I look at it, some of the equipment focus has been on, you know, maybe like a paraplegic that still has use of both arms, right? But what can we do to help someone who has cerebral palsy? They can only use one arm. How can we adapt equipment so that they could still get a good workout using you know special equipment for that? And, and I don't think that equipment uh, can has to be that different. It just needs to be designed in a way that it can be used by anyone. We don't want special equipment for someone with a disability and a different set of equipment for someone that doesn't have it. We should be able to, we have, we can send people to the moon. We can figure out how to create equipment that can be all inclusive. The experience at a lot of the gyms and fitness facilities, they stack the equipment together so tight that you can't get a chair through there. That shouldn't happen. Why? Why can't we rethink how we lay out things so it can be more accessible? Uh, and we think about you know we may put a piece of equipment out there, but then we don't have anyone to help someone that that has a disability as they roll up and if they need something to if they need help just wiping a piece down, we don't provide the infrastructure, the staff, the what have you for that. Those are the kind of simple low hanging fruit that we can change, but we have to be the change. And so people like you and I, and I'm sure there's many more out there. The more that we can normalize that and create the right access points and create the right you know expectations for everyone and then we also have to have a more inviting culture as well right how do we highlight that this facility is geared to help you all of you uh and, and i don't think we do enough of, of of advertising that so people have done this in different spurts of you know they have the equipment but they don't have the staff they have the staff with the knowledge but they don't have the equipment how do we put it all together? And I think that's going to be the challenge for us as we move forward. Uh, I love the fact that we focus on individuals with disabilities because we are trying to sort of level the playing field. But in my dream, my vision is that we shouldn't focus on them because they should be so normalized and assimilated into our culture that you shouldn't have to look around and hold the door open when someone comes in on a wheelchair because the system is set up for them to just come in and access and do and be. I had coffee at the coffee shop this morning and I, and I said to my friend, I was talking about my team Triumph as well. And I said, look around, do you see anyone here in a wheelchair? Why aren't they in here? Why do they feel that, that, ah, that's, that's too much. That's too hard to go and do. How do we set up a space where they can do and be everywhere they, they want to be. So I think that that's, I want to get to the point where people don't stare at someone that's in a wheelchair. Right? Yeah. We just yeah. celebrate, we celebrate the fact that they're out there 
enjoying life the way we do. So one of the cool things that we're doing right now, I just got back two weeks ago from a trip to the Middle East. We went, I went through Egypt, Jordan, and Israel, trying to figure out how could I take someone in a, in a wheelchair, someone with a disability, through a tour, through those areas, and we're making it happen for 2024. So watch this spot. <laughs> You're doing a lot of cool things, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, the, the, the comments on normalizing disability is what I've always been passionate about. It seems like it's a product, uh, like a project more of education and kind of reframing people's views on disability. And like you said, some gyms will be so tightly packed together and they might make the excuse like, oh, we don't work with people with disabilities. It's like, yeah, obviously you don't because they can't get into your gym. So right. it's like, yeah, no one's ever going to come to your gym because it's not accessible in that regard. So um, yeah, the normalizing disabilities is essential to me. I think inclusions, not just working with people with disabilities in isolation, it's creating systems and environments where they can coexist among their peers. So um, that's been the model that we've tried to adopt at my gym here. And then the model that we try to communicate people uh, to people with our curriculum as well. But uh, Terrence, thanks for thanks for joining me today. It was uh, the conversation lived up to uh, the expectations that I had for it. So <laughs> I, I really appreciate you taking the time. No, it's my pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity. And uh... I'm thankful for the work that you're doing outside in Massachusetts as well. Yeah, we'll we'll leave some links to my team triumph in the show notes, and uh, I'll follow up with you to get any relevant information that you want to share with the audience. Um, but again, thank you for your time. Oh, you're welcome. It sounds good. Have a blessed day. You as well. Thank you for listening to the AdaptX podcast. Our effort to amplify the ideas of our guests and create more inclusive and accessible industries is futile unless these episodes reach a larger audience. If you enjoyed our discussion today, please leave us a rating or a review on whichever platform you use. And if you would like to learn more about Adaptex, the course that we teach to health and fitness professionals and the projects that our organization is working on, you can subscribe to our newsletter through our website, www.adaptex.org. Until next Monday.